ve 2. Levanten Konferansı'nın ilk oturumu araştırmacı tarihçi Dr. Philip Mansell'in konuşmasıyla devam edecek. Bir Levanten şehri olarak Halep'i ele alacak Sayın Mansell ve kendilerini huzurlarınıza davet ediyorum. Buyurun. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for coming. And thank you so much, uh, Nuri Bey and uh, Beolu Benedier and Cray for arranging this incredible event. And um, I just want to remind you, Syrians in Istanbul now, well, there were always Syrians in Istanbul, indeed, under the Byzantine Empire, just across the road. 1831, the first public theater in Istanbul, the Teatro Naum, was founded by a Syrian family from Aleppo, the Naum, and who later worked in the Ottoman Ministry of Foreign Affairs and one of the best chroniclers of uh, late Ottoman Istanbul is Said Naum Duhani. Everybody here should read his books if they haven't. They're extremely amusing and they're quoted in the incredible exhibition at Saint Benoit that's on now of caricatures of 1900, which I also recommend. And I want to talk today about cities, cities having their own identity, as all of you know in Istanbul. Istanbul is a world of its own, a continent as indeed London and Paris are. They're not the same as nations or races or religions. In fact, location, population and the economy give them the power to defy or ignore a state. And you can see the huge contrast between London and the rest of England in the recent Brexit vote. They are organisms of their own whose inhabitants exploit but also need each other. And Aleppo, in particular, was a city with a rhythm of its own, challenging categories and generalizations, lying between the... Here it is. It's up there on the right, near the Mediterranean. Lying between the Mediterranean and the... Uh, between the Mediterranean and the Euphrates, between Anatolia um, and the Syrian desert. It was a bit of everything, Arab and Turkish, and there are many here tonight who have relations in Aleppo. Turks married Arabs, Arabs married Turks, Kurdish and Armenian, Christian, Muslim and Jewish. An Arabic-speaking city with a Muslim majority under the Ottoman Empire, Aleppo also became a center of French culture and Catholic missions. That French culture was there until yesterday in some houses. <laughs> Arabic was forbidden in the house, only French was spoken. And what distinguished Aleppo from other cities was its peaceful character until 2012. For 500 years, whatever their origin, its inhabitants lived together relatively harmoniously. There was one incidence of violence in 1850. So it was a great Ottoman city and a great Levantine city. What do you think are the characteristics of Levantine cities? Well, I would say location on or near the Eastern Mediterranean, the vital importance of diplomacy and trade, more important, than religion or nationalism, particularly in Aleppo, the role of consuls. As I, many books have been written about ambassadors, not enough about consuls and vice consuls. Polyglotism, the use of multiple languages, Arabic, Turkish, lingua franca, or Italian and French, and relative tolerance and balance between the communities. No single group was exclusively dominant. Lastly, the last characteristics I would say, which you also saw in Izmir, Alexandria, Beirut, and indeed Istanbul, was modernity. Really, they were beacons of progress, and in the end, as we all know, vulnerability. Um, so it was on the Eastern Mediterranean. It was conquered in 1516 
by Yavuz Sultan Selim at the great battle of Maj Darbik, north of Aleppo. It was until recently a Daesh stronghold. And from 1516, it is part of the Ottoman Empire. It is frequently used by the Ottoman Empire as a winter base for the army during the long and frequent campaigns against Iran to the east. So it's the only Arabic-speaking city where Ottoman sultans lived several times. Yavuz Sultan Salim and then three different times uh, Kanune Suleiman and then Murad IV in the 17th century. So it's already, it's got a special relationship with the Ottoman Empire. Damascus occasionally revolted, Aleppo did not. And there is a story about the visit of Suleiman the Magnificent in Aleppo. It's a traveler's story. A German doctor, Leonard Rauwolf, writes it in the 1570s. I don't guarantee that it's authentic, but still it was going around. There was a debate in his council in Aleppo over whether to expel Jews from the province. The Sultan then asked his advisers to look at a flower pot that held a quantity of flowers of diverse colours and bid them consider whether each of them in their colour did not set out the other the better. The more nations I have in my dominions under me, Turks, Arabs, Greeks, etc., the greater authority they bring to my kingdoms and make them more famous. And that nothing may fall off from my greatness, I think it convenient that all that have been together long hitherto may be tolerated still for the future. The council, of course, agreed unanimously. And that Ottoman belief in diversity or tolerance also reflected in the repeopling of Istanbul after the conquest in 1453, in the recruitment of Janissaries, and in many Ottoman texts praising the virtues of racial diversity, that is one reason why the empire lasted so long, in my opinion. I hear you see an early Ottoman view of Aleppo, the famous citadel, it's uh, the 1530s, Lassu Matrukci. Uh, the citadel has been much damaged recently, but not totally. And the citadel had been inhabited for over 2,000 years. Here you see a, an authentic view of uh, Suleiman. And this is a view of, not Aleppo, but Athens. And um, we'll come to that later. But this, this diversity that Suleiman wanted for Aleppo, which was also practiced in other Ottoman cities, it meant that uh, the Christian and Jewish population of Aleppo went up under the Ottomans. There were frequently the different communities would use each other's law courts for uh, will cases or marriage cases, for example, as they did here in Istanbul. And the trades were not exclusively dominated by one group. Um, and I'd like to quote uh, John Barker from a great Levantine family who also lived in Izmir and Alexandria. He claimed that most of the time men of different creeds live in peer perfect peace and not infrequently in relations of the closest friendly intercourse. John Lewis Burkhardt, who lived in Aleppo to study Arabic, it was a great city to study Arabic in, in the 19th century route, it is necessary to have lived for some time in Aleppo and to have experienced the mildness and peacefulness of the inhabitants, and the sobriety and regularity of the habits, to conceive it possible that the inhabitants of a town like Aleppo should continue to live for years without any legal master or administration of justice who had rows going on between different groups. And yet that town should be a safe and quiet residence. That is what it was in the Ottoman Empire, a safe and quiet residence. Um, here you see the importance of Aleppo as a travel destination. This is the route of one Venetian in the 17th century. He goes from Venice to India and then back again, both cases through Aleppo. It's on the road to India. And many English travelers did the same too. 
it was convenient for him because his uncle was consul in Venetian consul in Aleppo. This is a 17th century view done for Pembo by a French artist, 1674. The earliest view I've found of uh, a panorama of the city. You see the number of mosques, the walls, the hills, and the famous citadel. And this is the entry of a consul into Aleppo. The Venetian consul is entering Aleppo in state. He's been joined by merchants and consuls from other communities. And you see he's escorted by Turkish troops. So uh, armed men are escorting a foreign consul, rather like the entries, the state entries of ambassadors into Istanbul <coughs> to show they're protected by the Ottoman government. Um, anyway, we'll... I'm looking for something else. Um, and one form, uh, one proof of the tolerance of Aleppo is a famous room in the Berlin Museum. Anyway, uh, called Beit Wakil, and where the decorative motifs are Muslim and Christian. You see scenes from the Old and New Testaments, Salome's dance, Jesus, Mary, and St. George, portraits of Leila and Majnun, and hunting scenes. It's built for rich, rich Christian merchants. Thank you very much. Thank you. You see, here it is. It's, this alone is worth a trip to Berlin. 1600 to 1603, built for Isa bin Butros, and it's a visual expression of the mixed character of the city. And the room has been in Berlin since 1912, because already uh, Germans were interested in uh, Aleppo and the Ottoman Empire. There were many other such rooms in old Aleppo houses, tributes to the prosperity of the city. And the largest and oldest houses, like Beit Ghazale, were built for Christians. Uh, you see it again, and here you see animal figures. There it is again. So trade, tolerance, and Aleppo became famous for its manners. It was said, uh, Halabi Chalabi Wa Shami Harami, which I hope some of you understand. Uh, um, the man from Aleppo is a gentleman, whereas the man from Damascus is a rascal, or worse. Um, and there's another famous Aleppo proverb, if you do business with a dog, kindly call him sir. <laughs> the piazza equips its owner with seven languages. A man from Aleppo, it was said, could sell you a dried donkey skin. What was sold in Cairo in a month was sold in Aleppo in a day. It had this famous souk, 12 kilometers souk, one of the largest in the Ottoman Empire after Istanbul. A blind man could see his way through, could find his way through the souk just by the smell of the products on sale. And I'd like to quote some early traveler's accounts about the trade in Aleppo. John Eldred, treasurer of the Levant Company, uh, arrived in 1586 from Baghdad, a caravan of 4,000 camels. These caravans of camels were constantly going to and from Aleppo, from Isfahan, from the Hejaz, from the Gulf, and from Cairo. Hither resort Jews, Tartarians, Persians, Armenians, Egyptians, Indians, and many sorts of Christians, and enjoy freedom of their consciences, and bring thither many kinds of rich merchandises. And freedom of conscience, of course, at that time, could be enjoyed in very few cities in Europe. And it's because there were so many merchants from different countries in Aleppo, often living in their own Khan, near the souk, that, that is why Aleppo is referred to in Macbeth. Her husband's to Aleppo gone, master of the tiger. And the main trade was uh, 
silk, soap, spices, gokha, above all textiles, buying textiles from France and England and then selling them to other parts of the Ottoman Empire. And because it's a great trading city, from 1550, Armenians in Aleppo help run the silk trade with Iran. Armenians also run the customs. They're building churches, in theory forbidden under Sharia law, but new churches are built in Aleppo from 1616, if not earlier. Um, and uh, somebody called Petik was chief of the customs of Aleppo and traveled like a pasha. And Aleppo remained an Armenian city, a great Armenian city, until 2012. A uh, great center of Armenian publications, cookery, schools, and so on. The first president of independent Armenia in 1991 had been born in Aleppo. It's a great Venetian city, also a great Jewish city, um, which had the famous Aleppo Codex, which is now in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. It was the oldest and most reliable text of the Torah and was written and guarded in Aleppo until the 1950s. Um, and many Jews of Aleppo became consuls of Christian powers. That is what a Levantine city is like. It can cut away cliches. Powers might be anti-Jewish in Europe, like Russia or Austria, but they had Jews as uh, consuls in Aleppo, particularly the great famous Jewish trading family of Picciotto. Many people have written on them. Um, they would attend Catholic services in Aleppo as Austrian consul general. And now that they've left the city and uh, are now financiers in Switzerland. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm a bit, a bit confused by the order. Um, I want to get back to some pictures of consoles. entry of the consul. This is the memoirs of the Chevalier Davio, who is there in the 1680s. And they're a wonderful account of life in Aleppo, um, written partly for the court of Louis XIV, because he also had a job at Versailles, and he kept Louis XIV and Madame de Montesquieu entertained with accounts of Turkish marriage customs and other things. Uh, you can't believe it, but there were people traveling regularly between Aleppo and other cities. And it's an account of um, where the whole city is working like a, a very elaborate piece of clockwork. Each piece balances the other and makes it work. And each piece needs a lot of oil to keep it going. And the oil, of course, constant presence. Uh, he says all Ottoman officials needed a lot of presence all the time. And then everything worked perfectly. Um, and some of the earliest consuls were in Aleppo. The Dutch had a consul there from uh, 1607, before they had a consul, uh, an ambassador in Istanbul, i.e. trade in Aleppo was more important than diplomacy in Istanbul. Uh, France and England from the 1580s, they were probably the oldest surviving foreign consulates anywhere in the world. Um, and sources of knowledge. This book should be translated into Turkish and English. It is, it is a gold mine about Aleppo. This is a book by a, an English chaplain in Aleppo called Henry Maundrell about Englishmen going to, on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, 1697. It was an immediate bestseller and was translated into German, Flemish, and French. This is the natural history of Aleppo, the, the most complete account of an Ottoman city in a foreign language ever written by Alexander Russell. He was a doctor. He knew some Ottoman. He treated the Pasha, the Ottoman governor, and uh, many leading merchants of the city. He wrote a very complete account of the diseases, the animals, 
the flowers, every aspect of the city. And it has been translated into Arabic. And interestingly, he was also a Freemason, and there may have been a Masonic lodge bringing people together of different backgrounds in Aleppo from the 18th century. And consuls are there, they're not just diplomatic representatives, they're running their local community, they're supplying governments with information because often information about India or Arabia, who is winning which battle, they, it arrives in Aleppo before it arrives anywhere else and then was immediately sent on to Versailles or Westminster. And they were also buying up antiquities, Greek and Arabic manuscripts, Muslim manuscripts, the consuls would wait and then pounce the moment a mufti had died and with a good library and they would buy at the best price. So sometimes they were beaten by local merchants. So already the French government is buying Eastern manuscripts through Aleppo in the 1670s, if not earlier. And the same with the uh, British government. Um, 1673, the French ambassador in Istanbul, the Marquis de Nuantel, he's going round the Ottoman Empire with a copy of the capitulations, the agreement between the two governments regulating French presence in the Ottoman Empire. He has a copy to make sure every pasha and every local authority knows it and observes it. And uh, he goes through Aleppo in state, all the, this is his account, all the streets were lined with an extraordinary concourse of people, not only Christians, but also Turks. And in the Syriac church, the Suriani church he went to, the patriarch preached a sermon in praise of Louis XIV. Louis XIV is the ally of the Ottoman Empire, but at the same time, some local Christian authorities are urging him, and the chief of the Yazidis, are urging a French invasion of the empire. So there are already plans to grab bits, not only by Russia or Austria, but also by France. And here are some old photographs from the 1940s showing the Khans and souks of Aleppo, the commercial part of the city. There were about 50 Khans. There are the souks, the, the auction souk, the souk of the rope makers. More Khans, more Khans. They probably, most of the structures have, been, have survived, but not the decoration or the contents. This is another early view of Aleppo. And Aleppo is a center of knowledge and scholarship. The first Westerners to rediscover Palmyra are English merchants from Aleppo in 1678. And they tell a Dutch painter living in Aleppo about the city, and he draws this picture, which is now in the Allard Pearson Museum in Amsterdam, at the first view of Palmyra. There it is again. And here is a picture of, nobody knows who it is, it's by somebody called Andrea Soldi, a Venetian working in Aleppo, about 1731 to 3. He then goes back to London. Who is it? Why is his hair so wild? Why is his beard so wild? Is it a Westerner? Is it a local? Uh, is it a Russian pilgrim? Nobody knows. Or is it just a English or French merchant of Aleppo who's grown a beard, which wasn't normal. And here is a picture of an English merchant, also by Soldi, beckoning to the um, citadel in the background. Here's another English merchant by Soldi in the desert. One of the main occupations of people in Aleppo was hunting and shooting in the desert. He's got his game beside him. He's wearing very grand Ottoman dress, but I don't think he wore it at the time in Aleppo. I think it's, he bought it in Aleppo and then was painted in it back in London. I don't think it would have been legal or possible for him to wear yellow shoes, for example. And it's clearly a Christian servant in the 
background with a dark blue and a bonnet as they had to wear. And the horse is another sign of one of the main products of Aleppo. It wasn't just textiles, it was horses from the Syrian desert. And again, geography is the key to Aleppo's success. The best horses are bred in the desert because they're slimmer and faster and more agile and more athletic. The, city, the international city closest to the desert is Aleppo. Foreign merchants will pay better prices for the best horses than anybody else, even the Ottoman Sultan. In theory, the best horses were for the Ottoman Sultan and the imperial stables. But around 1700, English and French merchants would hide the best horses, sold them by Arab sheikhs from the desert, and then move them quickly over the mountains to the port of Aleppo, Iskanderun, and then send them to London or Paris. And all the racing horses of today are descended from three sires, as they call, foundation sires, from Aleppo and one was called the Bayali Turk from somewhere else in the Ottoman Empire around 1700. And it's a tremendous business for those of us who are not horse lovers. The proof of the importance is the fact that people bothered to commission photograph uh, pictures of their horses. They wouldn't necessarily have pictures of their wife or their children, but of their horse, yes, because it's so important as a sign of prestige and a means of transport. And this is a horse called the Dali Arabian that came out about 1710 from Aleppo. And you bought a horse on its genealogy. You had to know that the father, the grandfather, the great-grandfather was of pure equine stock. And Davia has a phrase in his memoirs where he says, the Arab horse sellers know the genealogies of their horses much better back for 500 years than any noblemen in France. <laughs> and that would have made Louis XIV laugh because they, they all faked their genealogies. But you couldn't dare fake the genealogy of a horse. More horse portraits. And this is the picture of a, Pole, a Polish man. Many travelers came from Russia and Poland and Central Europe. This is Count Rezewski, who arrives in Aleppo in 1818. He writes a brilliant account of the city, which is at the time uh, torn between two factions called Ashraf and Janis Janissaries, who represent different interests. The Janissaries, on the whole, were the townspeople more tolerant, and the Ashraf were the landowners more rigid. And he describes the conflict in 1818, and he draws uh, cartoons of the time, and the, his great interest was horses, buying horses for stables in Eastern Europe. But he never paid his bills, he gave lots of parties, lots of presents, and he left in disgrace. And Aleppo then, uh, it's it has a bad period in the 1830s. Muhammad Ali Pasha takes over um, and finally in 1840 the uh, Ottoman Empire recovers it and a process of modernization begins again. As you see, this is of the railway station which arrives about 1900. You see this Aleppo, the center of the routes. This is a map between the wars. This was the planned railway routes of the Ottoman Empire, including, of course, the famous uh, railway to Baghdad. That's a tourist post of the 1920s. And here's a merch, um, one of the last horse merchants in the 1940s. Obviously, the horse is more important than the people in this photograph. Music was a great tradition in Aleppo. An Arab musician, it was said, could not prove that made their reputation until they had sung in Aleppo, more critical as an audience than even Cairo. And Syrian 
musicians were very proud of their own musical tradition, different from that of Um Kalsum. And there's one famous uh, Syrian musician who is said to have sung for 13 hours non-stop at a concert in Caracas. I, I've forgotten his name for the moment. Why in Caracas? Because there were already Syrians settled in South America in the early 20th century. One of the main exports of Aleppo is not just <coughs> textiles and horses, but also people. People are leaving Aleppo, enterprising people from the 18th century to make uh, fortunes outside. First in Egypt, there's a huge uh, uh, emigration of Syrian mainly Christians, to Egypt right up to the 20th century, and later to Europe and America. Seeing that. <coughs> Musicians. Uh, here is a, a map around 1900 of Aleppo. You see the mosques, the most important, and then the consulates. These are the new quarters called Selimiye and Aziziye after Ottoman sultans. Here is the souk, the Bank Ottoman, extremely important, the citadel. But I would say far the most important building in the city is the Kazam, the barracks. Because however much the economy slid out of Ottoman control with the tobacco, foreign merchants, um, merchants having protection and so on. They always retained the military control of the city and that is what people tended to forget. Um, here you see the Kazan. This is a, a, a photograph from the legendary collection of uh, Madame Marash, which has been now destroyed and looted. It was, she was the descendant of a consul of Austria, living in the old Venetian consulate in, uh, near the Souk. She had photographs, objects, antiquities, costumes. And this shows different consuls meeting with Kurdish chiefs here around 1905. They're discussing the future of the city, probably. There is an Ottoman officer present. Um, already, there are many, it's not a golden age, the late Ottoman Empire, as you well know. There's much discontent, worry about the future. Kurdish tribes are restless outside Aleppo. They are threatening the city sometimes. The first intelligence mission of Lawrence of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence then, a young archaeologist, was to go to the Syrian coast, take some weapons, from a British battleship and transport them to the British consulate in Aleppo so it could defend itself in case of trouble. Um, here you see the, the Hamidian city and the inevitable clock tower. Yeah, one of the clock towers that he erected all around the empire, as you know, showing both traditional time beginning at sunset and modern time beginning at midnight. Let's hope the clock tower is still there. I don't know. Here is a salon of a wealthy merchant family of Aleppo around 1900, the Marcopoli, who supplied Lawrence with antiquities and dealt with everything. And they were consuls until the 1950s and now have left the city. Uh, the Altunian Hospital, now it has an extraordinary history. Another feature of uh, Levantine cities is polyglotism and multiple identities. The Altunians were both Armenian, Ottoman and partly English because they married English nurses from the 1870s. Dr. Altunian around 1905 founds the most modern hospital in Aleppo. Among his patients is Mustafa Kamal Pasha, then a commanding Ottoman officer in or near Aleppo, and he actually lives in the hospital some of the time when his health isn't good. So an Ottoman general is living in an Armenian hospital in Aleppo in the First World War. And this hospital went on until the 1950s, until it was nationalized by the Syrian government and 
the last Alpunian had in fact been a British agent, a friend of Lawrence, a British agent in the Second World War, uh, an, an advisor to early Syrian politicians in um, the first years of independence because of his knowledge and his contacts and his polyglotism, and then they were all thrown out after the ca catastrophic series affair of 1956. <coughs> The famous Hotel Baron, now closed, also run by Armenians, it opened in 1909. There is Lawrence as a young archaeologist, probably about 1913, outside the city of Karkamish with Leonard Woolley, who wrote a very good account of the city in his memoirs. And here is a group of Ottoman officers in the First World War, and you can see Mustafa Kemal, clearly recognizable. I'm not sure who all the others are. He is a representative of the Ottoman parliament. Um, and the last chief of staff of the Ottoman army until 1922 was Izzet Pasha, was somebody from Aleppo. Anyway, Aleppo survived most horrors. It's becoming modern. French is the second language of the city. Some families, as I said, forbade the uh, family members to speak Arabic at home. You had to speak French because there was a link to modernization and the modern world. It became a language of schools. It became, the Pashas knew French. It became a language of Jewish as well as Christian schools. Um, Aleppo is becoming really quite modern. Uh, the population becomes more Christian in the 20th century as Armenian and Suriani refugees come from Anatolia to Aleppo and Central Turkey College, an American missionary school in Gaziantep, reopened in Aleppo in 1924 and as Aleppo College it became one of the best schools in Syria. Here, but 1918, end of the Ottoman Empire, the last battle of that war is just north of Aleppo, led by Mustafa Kemal as he's retreating with the uh, army. And he had also been involved in street fighting in Aleppo in October 1918. These are Australian troops outside Aleppo. There are at least two British military cemeteries outside Aleppo. Here you see a, a photograph of the citadel. Then there's a brief moment <coughs> when um, Syrians have control of their own destiny. This shows a picture of the Emir Faisal entering the city in 1919. The Hashemite leader of the Arab revolt, who had also been an Ottoman deputy in the parliament here. And what's interesting you see the Baron Hotel, the Western modern hotel of Aleppo. It's been used for a public Syrian demonstration. The balcony is packed. They're watching the Emir Faisal. So it's not an isolated imposition. It's part of the life of the city. And more or less, anybody who could stay in the Baron Hotel, including the Emir Faisal and later President Gamal Abdel Nasser. Here is the Emir Faisal himself, painted by Augustus John. He's briefly king of Syria in 1920. Then his forces were defeated and the French arrived. The long-awaited French occupation of Syria that many Frenchmen had been dreaming of since Louis XIV and many local Christians also. Um, it lasts from 1920 to 1946, the French mandate. De Gaulle is among the officers there. Not much was achieved. Damascus was bombed twice. Aleppo escaped. Um, but Syrians tell me the antiquities were very well surveyed, looked after, catalogued, and uh, <coughs> protected. This is another pro-facial demonstration in Aleppo. Uh, by the way, Aleppo had been relatively peaceful in 
the First World War, while Arab nationalists were hanged in uh, Damascus and Beirut in Aleppo, Jamal Pasha, the Ottoman governor, was entertained to tea by Aleppo ladies. I have an invitation in my book quoted um, where they played music together. Here you see the entry of the French High Commissioner General Gouraud in 1920. Not, not many people were watching. It was extremely unpopular to begin with, the French occupation. Aleppo is becoming more modern. This is the photo the photograph of an Aleppo Muslim lady in 1930s. She's totally uncovered, at least in a courtyard. One of the British military cemeteries. Uh, this is, these are some photographs of the Altunian Hospital. You see how modern it was. This is a, a wedding, more wedding. Um, and 1941 to 46 is a strange period when uh, the French are still theoretically have the mandate for Syria and Lebanon. In fact, there are British political officers everywhere, and they run. They're preparing Syrians for national independence, encouraging them, and they also have a strange unit in Aleppo. M multiple languages were one of the characteristics of Levantine cities. Because people in Aleppo could speak Turkish as well as Arabic, Kurdish, Armenian, British Special Operations Executive recruited Kurds and Armenians for possible operations in Turkey, in case Germany invaded Turkey, or Turkey joined Germany, they were going to blow up railways and bridges and roads all over Turkey. And they were called the Kalpaks. And they were so good and so enthusiastic at it, at it that they were used later in the Aegean, in Sicily, and then I don't know what happened to them. Anyway, as I said, vulnerability is the other characteristic of Levantine cities. Many have had horrible ends in the 20th century. Think of the destruction of part of Izmir, the end of cosmopolitan Alexandria, the Beirut civil war, and Aleppo, it finally came in 2012, later than other Syrian cities. Already in the 1950s, many businessmen had gone to settle in Beirut, New York, or Buenos Aires, and think of the Safra family, originally from Aleppo, one of whom was murdered in Monte Carlo, but his brother, uh, Joseph Safra, is now the richest man in Brazil. But Aleppo has followed the path of Sarajevo, Beirut, Nicosia, and many others, because basically cities depend on armies and states, on force, Cities need armies. As Voltaire wrote, God is on the side of the big battalions. If a state supports a mixed city, it will flourish. If the state weakens or turns hostile, or outside forces attack, cities are vulnerable. And that is what happened to Aleppo after 2012. Terrible fighting, unbelievable suffering, barrel bombs launched by the Syrian government from um, aeroplanes, no soap was made in Aleppo for the first time in 2,000 years because the soap factories had been burned. The minaret of the great mosque collapsed. Many churches have been destroyed. And Aleppo is now surrounded not only by ruined Roman cities, but also by ruined and destroyed factories because it had been the commercial center of um, Syria. I'll just quote for a few Syrians. Right now in Aleppo, wrote the novelist Khalid Khalifa, the everyday question is how not to die. When a place gets wrecked, it does not become ruined alone. It ruins its people also. These are some parties in the 1950s in Aleppo. This is a religious procession. You could have a Christian religious procession in the early 1960s through the streets of Aleppo. This is what it has become. Um, and he said, one of the major crimes of the Arab regimes is robbing and destroying this deep memory. The city I told about in my novel is another city, a city that does not exist. The population has declined maybe to 500,000. Um, 
states and religions have been killing the city. Since the end, the, maybe a truce at the end of the Civil War, maybe things are being... <coughs> that, that is the state of the Beit Ghazali today, a recent photograph that's sent to me. You can f read more about it on the internet. Maybe things will get back to something resembling normality, but everything now rests in the triumphal <coughs> hands of President Assad and the Syrian government. Thank you very much. Araştırmacı tarihçi Sayın Doktor Filip Bensal'a çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Değerli konuklarımız. Evet, sunumun ardından. Ben bir şey söyleyeceğim. Yok, Sayın Mansel'in yazdığı ve Türkçe'ye tercüme edilen üç tane kitabı az sonra dışarıda bulabilirsiniz. Arzu edenler Filip Mansel'in kendisine imzalatabilirler. Teşekkürler. Yarınki oturumumuz saat 10'da Özel Zorafyon Lisesi'nde olacak. Atlas Pazacı'na çok yakın bir mesafede. Hepinize iyi akşamlar diliyoruz. <gülüyor>